Okay, so we want to thank everyone for uh, coming to this uh, joint biology chemistry assembly and we have a really great speaker and topic for us today. Why care for creation? 10 reasons for being an earth keeper. Before we proceed further, we will have a pastor at our church here on campus, Pioneer Memorial Church, Pastor Jennifer Daly, to offer a word of prayer for us to begin. Thank you, Dr. Mori, and good morning, everybody. We thank God this morning for this opportunity that we have to meet together. And what a blessing it is that we can pray to God. So God who hears us, who promises to answer even before we call. So will you join me now as we pray to this awesome God? Everlasting God, creator of everything on earth and even under the earth. Oh, how we worship you this morning. You who made everything out of nothing. We thank you that all things animate and inanimate were created by you. For the beauty of the earth and the glory of the skies, we give you thanks this morning. For indeed, the heavens declare your glory and they show your handiwork. The eloquence of your creation extends far beyond what we can see. We, everywhere we go, there is evidence, there are signs, there's proof, there's beauty of your creative voice that said, let there be. What an awesome God you are. Oh, how we worship you this morning. We thank you that you are so good to us, not only in creating the world, but in creating us so that we can enjoy your presence and you can teach us about what it means to enjoy your love. Only you can make the skies look blue today and different tomorrow. Only you can bring life in the spring out of the deadness of winter. Only you can make the clouds pregnant and give birth to rain that waters the earth. Your creative power, O oh God, calls us to an intimate relationship with you so that we can enjoy the warmth and the kisses of your sunshine that remind us when it gets dark that, that you did promise that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. So we hold to those promises. Forgive us, Lord, when we miss these beautiful, creative evidences of who you are. Forgive us when we misuse them. Forgive us when we, we, we lose sight of the treasures of your creation. I pray today, oh God, for each person on this online circle, for every family that is represented here, you know each of our hearts, you know each of our minds, you know each of our hopes, each of our fears, each of our dreams. May the reminders that we will hear today about your creative power and our responsibility to steward the earth, may they remind us of what you can do to create and recreate our own very lives. Give us hope as we await the coming of Jesus. May they encourage us. We long for that day when he will come, when he will recreate the earth, when all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshattered beauty and joy, will declare that God is love. Until then, Lord, we pray that you'll keep us faithful, that you'll teach us how to love you by loving your creation. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So thank you, Pastor Daly. So um, our speaker today is um, joined the Hope College um, in 1994, and he is currently a professor of religion there. 
Uh, he served uh, for about seven years, 2006 to 2013 as chair of the religion department. And uh, he's also was the associate dean for teaching and learning, 2013-2017. Uh, but more relevant to what we are going to hear today, perhaps, is that he oversees the environmental studies minor and chairs the campus sustainability advisory committee known as the Green Team at Hope College. So, um, Professor Steve Boomer, Digger, please. We thank you for accepting our invitation and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Murray and all the others behind the scenes who uh, made this possible. Can you hear me okay? Louder? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, you're okay. All right. Yes. Yes. All right, 10 reasons for being an earth keeper. Why care for creation? Uh, I should explain the first slide here is a group of Hope students and uh, three instructors, the gentleman in the back leaning down with his hands on his knees with the green. Uh, Parka is uh, a cohort in crime. I, for 40 years, have led wilderness backpacking, canoeing, rock climbing, whitewater rafting trips in the Adirondacks of upstate New York my ecological theology and ethics course that I've been teaching for our May terms. We have a four week session in May after the regular calendar year is over where you can take one course intensively for four weeks. And um, gosh, students sign up, there's no other classes, they're only taking my class, why stay on campus? Let's go somewhere interesting and actually live together for a couple of weeks. So this is a May term group from a few years ago. Kai Rowe House, Key Rowe, the first uh, two letters in Greek of the word Christos, Christ, and that's one of the uh, buildings at uh, Fowler Camp and Retreat Center in uh, South Central Adirondacks. My buddy Kent, he and I and our wives led trips together many years ago all over the country. Right below him is his daughter Hannah, and next to Hannah is Jenna, one of my uh, longtime uh, co-instructors. The uh, young woman in the front row with right in the middle with the uh, what orangish shirt is my youngest daughter, Sophia, who is a Hope student and had the courage enough to take a course with her dad in the Adirondacks for a couple of weeks. So let's get started. How many of you breathe? Show of hands. All right. Back to, yeah, there we go. I got to go back there, okay? Mechanics of breathing. We take it for granted. Every breath we take, we don't even think about it. Our lungs, part of our autonomic nervous system, simply do the right thing at the right time. Oxygen comes in, that gas that we need in every cell in our body for it to work properly, down into our lungs. And without even thinking about it again, those muscles in our chest push up and squeeze the lungs, out comes the waste gas, carbon dioxide. The mechanics of breathing. Well, those solar panels we call leaves are doing uh, somewhat the same thing outside. There aren't too many deciduous leaves right now, but uh, give us a month or two. And uh, from our star, the sun comes sunlight onto those solar panels. This magic we call photosynthesis occurs where uh, from that light and the water that the tree is sucking up, um, taking in our waste gas, carbon dioxide, and producing oxygen, which we need to live. Very uh, interesting and obviously much needed cycle that we often take for granted going on all the time in the world around us. Any tree huggers here besides me? I'm often accused of being tree huggers. Yeah, well, here's some uh, friends. I don't actually know these folks, but from Australia, the city of Unley, and uh, adopt a tree. That's sort of their motto. Hug a tree. Whether you're young, old, male, female, doesn't matter. An Aussie or a Kiwi. I teach courses in the Creation Care Study Program in New Zealand every spring break. Been there about a dozen times. Those Kiwis are doing some pretty amazing things on their country. Of course, it's an island. We are, too, an island. We just it's a lot bigger than New Zealand, 
Maybe we ought to think like the Kiwis do. We're on an island. What does that mean for how we live? And uh, here you got a bunch of uh, tree huggers. Here's the first reason to care for creation. If you breathe, thank a tree. The self-interest argument. If we don't protect the Pacific yew, that's a tree that's grown, grows on the west coast of the United States and Canada. There won't be any taxol. That's a drug that's extracted from the bark of mature yew trees. And because of that drug, uh, it saves the lives of women who have ovarian cancer. Something extracted from a tree can save human lives. My biology colleagues at Hope, maybe you all can confirm this or disconfirm it. They tell me now that we can make this, this scarce resource, we can make it biologically in the lab, don't have to cut down trees, yew trees, to extract the chemicals that we need to make it. The point is simple though, whether it's air that we need for our lungs or uh, a drug, a cancer drug from a tree, we should care for creation because if we destroy or even severely diminish certain creatures or parts of creation, our own existence is imperiled. Where do you get your water around here? The water I drank just a bit ago from the drinking fountain. Where does it come from? Who knows? A well. A well. Okay. Where I'm from, the water comes from Lake Michigan. There's a big pipe about 20 feet in diameter, about a mile out offshore of Lake Michigan, sucking in millions of gallons of water so that the 150,000 people or so who live in the greater Holland area have water from their drinking fountain. When I live in Chicago, same thing. Six, eight million people who live in Chicago, where does your water come from? For most of them, from Lake Michigan. So you don't want to pee and poop in your water. You don't want to put toxic chemicals in Lake Michigan. Same sort of thing. If we destroy or even severely diminish certain creatures like yew trees or certain parts of creation like Lake Michigan, our own existence is in peril. And 20% of the Earth's surface fresh water is in the Great Lakes. I'll repeat that. One fifth of all the surface fresh water on our home planet is in the Great Lakes. Almost half of it in one of those lakes called Lake Superior because it's so deep. So if you breathe, thank a tree. Iconic photo of uh, an older person teaching a younger person how to grow food. One of my favorite uh, baby t-shirts, fight global warming, do it for me. And have you heard of this organization? Seventh generation? Google them, find out what they're up to. Why the seventh generation? The great law of the Haudenosaunee, one of the Iroquois Confederacy tribes native to Michigan, puts it this way. Here's their motto for life. In our every act and every deliberation, we must consider the impact and the consequences of our decisions for the next, guess how many, generations. Seven generations. The earth is on loan to us from our children and our children's children. On loan from our children. We not only inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Students, I'm presuming you don't have children. Older folks, maybe you do. I have three daughters. I've got some grandkids now. And I've never yet given a talk somewhere with older people in the audience that didn't desperately want the earth that they give to their children and grandchildren to be at least as good, if not better, than the one they inherited from their parents and grandparents. Why care for creation? Because we owe it to our children and our children's children. That's not quite right. Owe it, you know, it's a language of obligation and duty. Again, most parents and grandparents should do it because you love your kids. Mm -hmm. You want the air they breathe and the water they drink to be at least as good as it was when you were their age. On loan from our children. Here's a motto that uh, some would say, uh, dominates our culture. Descartes was cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Now it's I shop, therefore I am. This is one consequence of uh, living by that motto, I shop, therefore I am. Chris Jordan, Google him and see what kind of art he makes. That top slide is about as big as this whole front wall. 
It's a work of art. Two million plastic beverage bottles. Two million plastic beverage bottles. The number used in the United States every five years? No. Five months? No. Five weeks? No. Every five minutes. Two million plastic beverage bottles. We throw them away, which is simply a euphemism for somewhere else, not in my backyard. There is no way. You remember nothing else from this talk? Remember that. There's no such thing as a way. Throw away is simply a euphemism for take it to some dump somewhere, a landfill. So you can see the close up in the middle of the top, a little chunk of the top, and then the bottom slide. Now you can actually see what this is these 2 million uh, plastic beverage bottles in this work of art by Chris Jordan. Here's an alternative. So that's the operative motto of our culture, at least here in North America. Here's an alternative from a shaker, Google shakers, those uh, interesting Christians. Live simply that others may simply live. Reason number three to care for creation. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in that place just right, it will be in the valley of love and delight. I sing only when I'm hiking and in the shower. I'm not going to sing that for you, but I just gave you the lyrics to an old Shaker hymn. Tis a gift to be simple. The joyful simplicity argument. Why well, care for creation? More is not necessarily better for our personal well-being or for the earth. Indeed, living with simple elegance is more joyful than living caught in our consumer culture. Why I care for creation? Because such an earth-friendly lifestyle is simply more joyful, more joy-filled. Chicago area, little air pollution in the background, African-American boy in the foreground, also Chicago, a playground. Interesting where they put the playground, near a refinery. Or a now classic book by an African-American sociologist, Robert Bullard. We had Bob on campus a few years back. Dumping in Dixie, race, class, and environmental quality. Bob was one of the leaders in science social scientifically putting together the fact that uh, there's an interesting correlation between toxic waste sites and where uh, dark-skinned people live in this country. Is that just an accident or not? And uh, the conclusion he came to was it's not an accident. You want to uh, have a high probability guess on where the toxic waste site is? Just tell me where the, in my in Holland, Michigan, where the uh, Latino, Latinx folks live. Where do the folks who speak Spanish live in town? 40% of the people in Holland, Michigan speak Spanish at home. So maybe I should have said bienvenidos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of you speak Spanish, I'm sure. Um, Bob says, no, that there's connections between race and class and gender and environmental quality. You want to learn more? Read his book. The argument goes like this, poor and oppressed unite. People who are poor, socioeconomically oppressed, and the earth that is oppressed. Because the racial composition of a community is the single variable, variable best able to explain existence or non-existence of commercial hazardous waste facilities in that area, that's Bob Bullard's conclusion, we must make a link between environmental pollution and issues of racial and social equity. I've been all over the world. I've never seen a place come to a place where there isn't a connection between environmental issues and social justice issues. Hence the term eco-justice coined about 30 years ago to try to describe this connection between social justice issues and environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So why should we care for creation? Because the various forms of oppression are of a piece. 
If people are being oppressed in your community, probably the earth is too, and vice versa. All right, extra credit bonus points, if you know what that is. Easy answer, owl. Okay, got it. <clears throat> Anyone know? On the endangered species list, at least it was some time ago. Spotted owl, excellent. A northern spotted owl. All right, here's a, I don't know if it's easier or not, but a Michigan bird. Someone knows. Kirtland's warbler, indeed. It's not all bad news. This bird was listed in 1973 in the original Endangered Species Act. I have a book on the Endangered Species Act and why Christians ought to support it. And it's now off the list because we've been taking care of these birds. They populate the lower peninsula of Michigan, come to nest and reproduce, mm -hmm. migrate elsewhere, come back to Michigan. And because people in Michigan have been taking care of this bird's habitat, the bird is not nearly in as bad a shape as it was some decades ago. All right, extra credit bonus point, Chicagoans, if you've been to the aquarium there, you ought to know this baby. A beluga whale. Boy, you guys are an environmentally uh, literate group. Beluga whale, almost no one knows that unless they're from Chicago. Mm. What's the point? Spotted owls and beluga whales and Kirtland's warblers have rights too, the animal rights argument. Because certain uh, higher animals, higher on the phylogenetic scale, have the same relevant properties as humans, for example, sentience or the capacity to suffer, they too have the same rights. This is a very contentious argument. Some people don't think animals have rights. We have duties as humans to animals, but they don't have rights of us, vis-a-vis -vis us. We won't talk about that debate right here. But the point is that some animals are sentient, as we are. Your cat or dog at home, pets you have. Our chinchilla, who we had for many years. Um, probably not the pet snake, but we, again, where you draw the line at sentience, we can and talk about that maybe, but the point is there are at least certain non-human creatures that have the capacity to suffer. They too then have the same rights. Why should we care for creation? Because certain kinds of non-human creatures are entitled to such care. One of my favorites. Anyone been there? Hugged a tree that size? Sequoia dendron gigantea. Giant sequoia, you can find them in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks in uh, California in the Central Valley. Pray for your friends in the Central Valley of California right now if you're not up on the latest news. One of my co-authors, co-editors, teaches at Fresno Pacific University. And uh, because of uh, climate change, they're having hellish, I use that term advisedly, hellish weather. Mudslides, flooding, so. Giant Sequoia, put this on your bucket list for life. You got to visit this place and take, uh, you know, everyone in this room have to hold hands to get all the way around this tree. It's about as big around the big ones, almost as big around as this entire room. Uh, it's my daughter, Sophia. Um, took them on a backpacking trip. We finished uh, all three of my daughters. My wife is not able to do that sort of thing anymore because of back injury. So, um, and we got out a day early. I surprised them. We drove to where you can actually touch these trees, the bark of which is you know 18 to 24 inches thick. The bark alone around the tree. So breathtaking. This is looking up. Mm -hmm. Those branches up there, I think, are taller than taller than any building around I, here that I've seen. You know, eight stories up. So. What's the point? Those trees and many other things have what ethicists call intrinsic value, value in and for themselves. In addition to their instrumental or use value, they're valuable simply because if you're a Christian, God made them. And since there's intrinsic value in nature, I would argue in sequoia trees, and since the presence of such value generates duties for we humans, we have obligations to care for non-human creatures. Why care for creation? Because creation is valuable for its own sake. 
A uh, simple diagram, in this case, of a grassland ecosystem showing different parts. Don't forget about all those decomposers in the ground that most of us never see. Here's a little chart that's kind of fun. Maybe you've seen this in an ecology course. Different kinds of interaction, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism. I still remember learning this in high school biology a long time ago. Both benefit. One benefits, one's unaffected, commensalism. A whale and a barnacle, for example. And then, of course, parasitism. One side benefits, the other is harmed. A tick on a dog. Maybe this is a more eye-catching example of this argument. Our home planet out there in space, photograph taken from the moon. I don't see any uh, international boundaries or barriers. No different colored countries like on our maps. Just a lot of blue. 70% of their surface is water. And that looks like the uh, Sahara Desert in Northern Africa in Middle East. What's the point? We're all in this together, sink or swim. The community of creation argument. All creatures are bound together in such a way that their flourishing is interdependent. So we should act in a way that enhances the life of the whole community. Your dormitory, your college, your city, state, province, country, planet, at whatever scale, we're all in this together. So we should care for creation because such care is in the best interests of creation as a whole. All right, Chicagoans, what does it say in the side of a Chicago police car beside Chicago police? Those of you up front, what's it say there in, in uh, red? We serve and protect. I lived in Chicago for seven years, my wife and I, and uh, one of our daughters was born there. And uh, I always chuckle every time I saw a Chicago police car because they're quoting a Bible verse. In a city that sort of prides itself for its police corruption, and other forms of political corruption, here they are quoting a Bible verse, and they don't even know it, I'm guessing. Serve and protect. Here's some folks serving and protecting. This is at Camp Fowler in upstate New York. Some of my midterm students on a service project in the garden. Here's a whole book that's about serving and protecting. Beyond Stewardship. New approaches to creation care. The divine command argument. Where you say, does it say this in the Bible? Well, Genesis 2.15. We humans, Adam from the Adama, there's a pun in the Hebrew. Adama is dirt, soil. That's where we get our name. We are Adam because we're made from the Adama. God takes some of that Adama and breathes into it, and lo and behold, here we are. So we're dirt creatures. That's the one side. Called to Avad and Shamar, Genesis 2.15, to serve and protect. That's our calling. That's why we're here. Whether we're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, atheist, agnostic, doesn't matter. Our human calling, according to Genesis 2.15, is to serve and protect. So since God commands that we care for creation, since authentic faith requires obedience to God, we should care for creation as part of our, speaking to a Christian audience, Christian discipleship. When I'm with Jews, it's Jewish discipleship, Muslim discipleship. Why care for creation? As God says so. All right, moving on. Your last, last extra credit bonus point, uh, Question here, what do we got here? An easy answer, birds in a tree. Who knows? Psalm 104, verse 17. Probably haven't memorized that one. Someone knows. Storks. Storks in a fir tree. Psalm 104, 17. The whole Psalter is beautiful, but Psalm 104 is the symphony of creation psalm. Look it up if you're not familiar with it. Storks in a fir tree. And uh, about 600,000 storks fly every other year in migration. 
over Israel. This is a slide actually from storks in a fir tree in Israel. And then there are wild goats. That's verse 18 in Psalm 104. You gotta love the goatee on this one. Isn't that great? Those big horns. This also is from Israel. It's right out of Psalm 104. Again, verse 18. This planet, have you noticed our home planet? How beautiful it is. Incredibly beautiful. This is from the Pacific Northwest, a little dusting of snow on top there. Beautiful lake. God's concerns are our concerns, the image of God argument. We're meant to be God's image bearers. That's also in Genesis 1 and 2. Since being an image bearer of God involves caring for the needs of others, including our non-human neighbors, you must show concern for more than just humans. So why care for creation? Because God's concerns for other creatures ought also to be our concerns. You have a friend, your friend's concerns, whether it's music or athletics or reading certain kinds of books, Books probably rubs off on you. Your friends' concerns become your concerns. Likewise here. Last but not least, we touched on this already, but this is a slide I took on a solo backpacking trip um, a couple sabbaticals ago in the Pacific Northwest. I've got family up there, my wife's family actually. And I scheduled in after a Speaking engagement and family visitation, a little backpacking trip in the Cascades. Stunningly beautiful planet. But you don't need to go to a fancy uh, national park. You can just go in your backyard. Maybe it's the park down the street and be uh, stunned by the, the beauty of a butterfly. Photos from North America, 16 of them, different times of day, different places. Mars doesn't look like this, or Venus. This home planet of ours, what a beautiful place it is. For the beauty of the earth. Hmm. The Grateful Heart Argument. This is my favorite. It goes like this. Care for creation is a fitting response of gratitude for creatures like us who experience God's bountiful and gracious provisions. Yes, preeminently in Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, who died on a cross, was later resurrected, and the Holy Spirit, who, like the wind, shapes us, moves us, forms us, sanctifies us. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew way of saying God created everything, because there isn't a word in Hebrew for universe. How do you say God made it all? God created the heavens and the earth and everything in between. Creation is a fitting response of gratitude for creatures like us who experience God's bountiful and gracious provisions. We should care for creation because grace begets gratitude and gratitude begets care. What better way to say thank you to God than by caring for what God has given us? Mm -hmm. Not least the world in which we live. So here you have them, one through 10. Quiz time. <laughs> Look at that list. Which one of those do you think is the most persuasive, most compelling for you? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Actually, I like one and 10. One in 10, why do you like one? Uh, because it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You voiced a view that's probably uh, shared by others in the room. <laughs> why number Why number 10? I'm curious about that one. I love beauty. Beauty, I just love, yeah, beauty is, I mean, not just in nature, beauty of um, thoughts, of ideas, of, you know, beauty that, that, really appeals to me okay and along with that is gratitude 
All right. Thank you very much for chiming in, getting us started. Someone else, which one do you uh, find most compelling or persuasive? Looks like Danilo has a hand up. Yes, I, I, I thank you for this presentation. Um, as I was thinking about these topics, it occurs to me that the very fact that we need to learn to value things which are of value as opposed to things which are of, shall we say, lesser value. <laughs> if we learn to value things which have transcend transcendent values, then we will be ennobled and lifted and we will have the same effect on everything around us. Preach it, if, brother. If we become just preoccupied with how we can get whatever we can get this often as, as much as we can get it, then we're going to devalue everything around us. Mm -hmm. Yep. I say preach it. I mean it. That's that's one of the main points here, right? What do we value? Why do we value it? And how do we live out those values in our lives, everyday lives? And it seems to me that what we value, we actually become. If we value things that are transcendent, we become greater by it. Mm -hmm. We value things which are just of, of self-interest. Mm -hmm. Then we become vain. Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental um, point in, in biblical anthropology of view of the human person, that we are not just uh, homo sapien, wise, supposedly wise creatures, we're homo religiosus, we're religious creatures, we worship something. Mm -hmm. If not God, it's something else. Mm -hmm. And we become like what we worship. By beholding, we become changed. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's a great point to make. Got yeah. a bunch of hands up over here in the, in the, uh, in the room. So, okay. yes. Uh, depends on what you mean is real. What's really real? So, Steve, can you summarize the comment and or question? Yeah, it's uh, uh, we need to acknowledge that we we consume things. Mm -hmm. And the American culture is preeminently a culture of growth. Mm -hmm. Growth, our economy, the things that we use to measure our economy, gross domestic product, et cetera, GDP, for example, it's all based on growth. Mm -hmm. The assumption is that growth is always a good thing. Well, I think we have to acknowledge, first part of your response is, that, yeah, we're an organism that consumes things. That's just how we're made, right? Mm -hmm. I had breakfast this morning. I hope you did too. Um, so consumption in itself is not a bad thing, but making it a God is. Mm -hmm. That uh, plastic bottle slide, for example, right? Mm -hmm. We can't consume, we in the United States especially, mm -hmm. at the same rate at which we have in the past where we're a small percentage of the global population producing you know, half the trash of the world. So consumption is part of our makeup, but we have to come to terms with this notion of growth. And I think uh, when it comes to classical or neo neoclassical economic theory, we have to question the assumptions that growth is always good. Mm. Depends on what kind of growth. Yeah. Think about growth in terms of biology. I mean. As one person put it, unlimited growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. That's what cancer is unstoppable growth. And some would say that's what we've been doing in the last 100 years or so by buying into this notion that all growth is always good, depends on the growth. 
So we've got to start thinking differently about our metrics when it comes to measuring success. Is it just GDP? And now there is an academic discipline called environmental economics. You can get a master's degree or a PhD in environmental economics. That, that wasn't possible 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. but there are now grad programs in that area. Just as there's environmental literature, environmental history, environmental is an adjective now in front of almost every academic discipline. Mm -hmm. I prefer the term ecological. That's another discussion, another debate, but ecological theology and ethics is what I do. But again, ecological economics. Eco comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home. Hmm. So it's all about the home. Ecological is the logos of the oikos, the study or the word, study of our home, our home planet. And we need good economists, but we've got to get away from this assumption that growth is always good. And uh, that's what drives our economy. So great question and a question we all need to think more about. So Steve, can I add a couple of points there too? Yes, please do. Uh, that there is all, what we overlook also is the duality that all of us are both consumers and producers. That's what mm -hmm. nature is patterned on, right? Consumption yeah. and production are in a cycle. And that's the other point that we need to put ourselves and imagine ourselves because we are a part of a cycle. Nature has water cycles, geochemical cycles. Yes. So um, the whole idea of uh, just growth without the context of those two things um, gets us off track. Yeah. Great, thank you. Very important point. Other questions? Perhaps growth in understanding is not limited, but growth in stuff is probably not desirable. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the stuff. You never have enough canoes. You know, I mean, that's obvious. Never have enough canoes. Mm -hmm. I'm just joking, but you're right. Yeah, what growth, again, what do we mean by growth? What kind of growth is healthy? What kind is not healthy? Got a hand way in the back. No, thank you for sharing that honest response. Uh, you're not alone in, in feeling the ouch of that, right? Could, could you tell us, um, summarize what was said? Because us online yeah. and here, and yeah. Yeah, uh, Porno Press Unite the Eco Justice Argument. It was just pointed out that that's one of the arguments that has the most punch, the most pinch, that right. it's most convicting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, because those issues are so pervasive, social justice issues in particular, but also environmental issues. And you, then you mash them together and say one's connected to the other. Yep. That, that affects all of us in certain ways, if we're honest, I think. It does, so, yeah. The job of a preacher, I'm told, is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. So maybe, <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, maybe that's uh, the second half of that preach, preacherly uh, vocation. <laughs> those of us who are too comfortable to, you know, feel yep. more afflicted. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Uh, go ahead, um, Danny. Yes. I, I was wondering if perhaps I could um, just mention something. I, I, my earlier childhood, I spent under communism. So I'm very familiar with ideological reasoning. Many times 
we human beings are very prone to go to either leftist or right-wing ideologies because we find comfort in having some kind of ideological stand. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, I've come to think that perhaps in today's language, ideologies are taking the same position that in Old Testament times idols used to occupy. <laughs> or they absolutely do. <laughs> no see, doubt. <laughs> and, and there is a difference between ideology and actual care for what is the truth of a matter. Yep. You see, the truth, as the Bible tells us, sets us free. Ideology enslaves. Mm -hmm. It does not set us free, no matter how well intentioned it may start out to be. It's 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 a strange phenomenon, but we are very, how should I say, prone to being righteous when it is not at our expense, when it is somebody else we can point to. <laughs> oh, so true. We are so, how should I say, hell-bent on doing this as long as we can see someone else at fault somehow. Mm -hmm. A cautionary tale for all of us. Yeah. And, and you see, that, that means that instead of seeking some suitable slogan or some rally point, what we need to come to appreciate is the transcendent value, the essential value of truth itself. Uh, Only then can we grow and learn something, and, and that is what will set us free from all affectation for whatever. I know. I know. I, yeah. Uh, sorry. So, I. I. I <laughs> that's okay. So we have a... I've, I've I've seen various political movements come and go, and yeah. I've seen various enchantments in the local churches come and go. And I'm thinking, what have we actually accomplished? Many times, not so much. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if we actually began to value truth beyond our personal interests for so, its own sake. So Thank we, you. That's a very important point. So we are pretty much at the end of our session. Steve, do you want to take us out with one last thought or so? Yes, I have a quote from uh, pioneering eco-theologian Joseph Sittler, Lutheran mm -hmm. pastor, who was writing about the connection between the Christian faith and environmental issues in the 1950s. Wow. Pioneering long before the 60s and 70s. So here's a quote from Joe. When we turn the attention of the church to a definition of the Christian relationship with the natural world, we are not stepping away from grave and proper theological ideas. We are rather stepping right into the middle of them. Hmm. There's a deeply rooted, genuinely Christian motivation for attention to God's creation, despite the fact that many church people consider ecology to be a secular concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does environmental preservation have to do with Jesus Christ and his church, these people ask? They could not be more shallow or more wrong. Hmm. End quote. Well, thank you so very much, Professor Steve Bomber Predigger, for accepting our invitation, for coming and um, giving us some really enlightenment um, in terms of our connections between the environment and our faith. I want to thank you very much for that, and we will uh, stay in touch. I believe you have some books that you have written on that, um, on this area. Sure. And I will try and make sure that, um, you know, we make those, uh, make that known to um, uh, 
to our audience and to others um, in social media. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.